What about a big uh, a salmon fly on the on off the? River? I've eaten. I've not eaten a salmon fly. I've done. I've done caddis flies. I did an October caddis fly. Do not recommend that. Really? Yeah. They oh, pop. that's right. They pop. Oh, I bit down and it was pow, and I was like, "Whoo!" It that's was right. you know in my twenties. And they're kind of fishing. furry. They're kind of hairy too, aren't they? A little yeah, bit. they're fuzzy, and it's, yeah. they're a moth. You know? Oh that's god! It is, oh, essentially god. ate a moth. Yeah, that was not cool. In our twenties, we were pretty pretty wild. You know, there was oh, yeah. rugby. There was fire, for, forest firefighting. There was a oh, lot yeah. of. We read a lot of Hunter S. Thompson, and uh-huh. so our fishing trips really kind of mirrored that. It wasn't really about the trip. That was James Millard talking about what it feels like to eat a live October caddis. James shares some truly amazing stories in this one today. We are on episode number 29 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Before I get into the intro, I wanted to remind you again to follow us on Instagram at instagram.com slash wetflyswing. In today's episode, I interview James Millard, the operations manager for OPST. James talks about what it feels like traveling all over the world as a kid, rugby, and flunking out of college. We get into the commando head uh, and in some detail, talk about how jet boat wakes actually help steelhead fishing, the grease line presentation, and a little bit of a chat on Great Lakes versus West Coast steelhead. Don't miss this as James explains what it feels like to literally have a fly rod blow up in your face leaving a bloodied and battered young James. So, without further ado, here's James Millard from OPST. I want to share one other quick note on this episode. The first 10 minutes, there's a little bit of a banging, rattling sound that might be a little bit annoying to you, but uh, just hold tight. After about 10 minutes, uh, we take care of it. So, um, if you can hang in there for the first little part, uh, I think you'll be good to go. How's it going, James? Pretty good. How are you doing? Good, good. Yeah, it's uh, good to have you on here. We've uh, we've been chatting for a little while, and uh, you guys are kind of a, you know, I'd say a, a leader in the steelhead uh, game now. You've been around for it sounds like about uh, six years or, or so, and you've got a lot of products. You de- definitely, your your name comes up quite a bit, you know, talking to people. So I'd love to dig into kind of the OPST brand and things like that. But maybe before we get there, you could talk about your background and how you got into fly fishing and, and how you connected with the the guys at, um, at uh, Pierce Gadget. Um, yeah. So I, I started fly fishing when I was really young, but not really what I would consider religiously until like eighth grade. Um, we grew up overseas and so I was, you know, my, my girlfriend always calls me, a um, Irish Hawaiian cause I'm hmm. Irish. My parents were, I was adopted. My parents were Irish, but, um, I was born in Hawaii, Honolulu, Hawaii, huh. um, and on an air base. Yeah. And so my parents adopted me in 1978. And so I grew up there for about four years. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I remember like <laughs> half a year of it, but my dad fished a lot and he was a gear guy. He didn't, he didn't do any any fly fishing but um so growing up we moved a lot like so it was like four years there and then like three years in the philippines where we adopted my sister um oh, wow. yeah yeah and then uh we went to spain for a while um and then that's kind of when we started fishing more but europe doesn't have i mean there's great fisheries in europe but there's yeah. less so than there are here and so you know, where we were at, and plus with my parents' schedule, there wasn't a lot of time to camp and fish and that sort of thing. And mm-hmm. so we did a little. But what we were doing the whole time was coming back to the States. My dad was in the Air Force. Okay. So, yeah, and so we didn't have to pay to fly anywhere. Yeah. So, um, yeah, which was cool. And so we would come back, and that's kind of like how some of my influences were were formed, is we'd either go to Southern California, <clears throat> excuse me, to see my my dad's side of the family, or we'd go to Alabama to see my mom's side of the family. And when we'd go to Alabama, which we did once a year, um, we would go fish. And so my grandpa, he, he, he didn't just fly fish, but he fly fished a lot. And he had a, him and my grandmother had a cabin and it was on a lake, but it was kind of a pond. It was like an inlet, you know, of this mm-hmm. lake. And it had a lot of what you might expect down there, warm water fish. Right. And so, 
he taught me how to cast and it was an old like i don't even know what weight it was and i don't have it obviously it was yeah. my uncle my uncle claimed this rod but <laughs> it was a uh, it was just fine it was an old fenwick you know fiberglass rod i don't even remember the reel wasn't even i don't even know but um taught me how to cast and you know that's the kind of the perfect if you know, don't ever take a kid unless you're a steelhead guy don't ever take a kid steelheading or something <laughs> when you're going to try to teach him to love fishing no. because uh-huh. he's not probably gonna and my i'd made that mistake with my oldest son yeah <laughs> he doesn't letting that much now yep. but um for for like warm water fish fly fishing or any kind of fishing that's a great way to introduce kids because you can catch bluegill at you know three in the afternoon or one exactly. in the afternoon oh that's kind of what really started me loving it but because we lived overseas and you know my dad did um, a lot of tdy style travel where he'd be gone for like six eight months there just wasn't oh, that wow. opportunity and i have some really funny memories of like being in tobago <clears throat> the philippines and trying to fish with a, a bent, just your classic, like Norman Rockwell. Like it was a, you know, a bent, a, a bent uh, safety pin with a piece of bread and floss <laughs> throwing it, whatever these weird fish were in this, nice. and of course, didn't, but you know, those were, you know, few and far between, but with my grandfather, I, that stuff really stuck to me and I liked it a lot. Um, and then my dad retired, my dad, we were on the East coast at that point we'd moved. I was in fourth grade and, um, we were right on the East Coast, and I fished a lot. I didn't fly fish a ton because, I, you know, that was a little bit of a bigger game out there. And, you know, at the age of whatever you were in fourth grade, <laughs> um, <laughs> you didn't have a lot of ca- you know, side cash to go buy saltwater-style fly fishing gear. So, um, you know, I still liked it, and I still read books about it and, you know, stuff like that. But I didn't actually engage in it um, super seriously until we moved to Oregon. But we fished a lot on the, on the East Coast, and that was fun. And I tied flies from – that was more what got me into it. Um, my grandfather tied flies and okay. he tied some beautiful deer hair, you know, bass, you know, you know, floating bass poppers that I've ever seen. It was like cork. He'd spin it so tight. Um, I have, I have a couple of those that I still salt away. in one of the desks says, like, memento, I'll never, fail. I'll never fish him. But, um, I started tying when I was like eight is when I first got my first vice. And then by the age of 10, I was doing it daily. Huh. Um, and so that's really what kind of stuck me into fly fishing. But then my dad retired from the Air Force in 1988. And so by 1989, we were in Oregon. And we met this couple named um, Charlene and Harvey, um, what's their last name? Gosh. Houston. <laughs> and they were um, our realtors, Harvey yeah. and Charlene Houston. And they're, they're our, our realtors, and they end up becoming – in the military, you end up because I don't know. It was a weird thing where friends start becoming aunts and uncles, like guys that my dad worked with that he was really good friends with. That was like, you know, Uncle Jim uh-huh. <laughs> and gotcha. Mary, you know, and we weren't related. So they made us call them. It was kind of weird, but it was cool because they were nice. But um, you know, aunt, aunt and uncle. But anyhow, they were big anglers. And he had property on the Williamson River in oh, Southern nice. Oregon, where we, we were. We moved to Klamath Falls, and so. Um, he was a big angler, and he brought me to all that, all those different spots that are around there, like Spring Creek. That I don't think you fish anymore, but it used to be a put and take fishery that also had some browns and some brooks that were mixed in with the, you know, the put and take rainbows that they put in. And then there was obviously the Williamson, and mm-hmm. then all that other stuff in Southern Oregon. He knew that stuff really well, and he was such a nice guy. And he just took me to all this stuff with my dad, of course. And so, in in that process, my dad didn't really get into the fly fishing thing, but I went full on. It was fifth grade. I just, I didn't even, hmm. I didn't even want to pick up a spinning rod. I did when I fished with my dad, yeah. but, um, really I didn't want it. I was full on into my first trout that I caught on spring Creek in Oregon was on a fly that I tied. It was a awful, I still have it. It's an awful, awful woolly worm that <laughs> doesn't look like thing you might eat, but it was a hatchery fish. So mm-hmm. yeah. And so that's really where, um, I really got started on, fly fishing just ex- exclusively with Southern Oregon, you know, fifth, mm-hmm. sixth, seventh grade. And then of course high school hit and we had mobility. We had friends with vehicles. And so then we started going a little farther and then I only fished unless I was with my parents in the summer. I only fished the Klamath river Canyon below the Keno dam, below the Boyle dam. Um, that was just, it was a good fishery and there was no one around. Mm-hmm. It was a hard hike down to get to those places and, Mm-hmm. So we fished those, and, you know, in the Boyle stretch of the Klamath River, you can catch, or you could, 
back then you could catch a lot of fish and just, you know, just with like a, a humpy <laughs> yeah. or, a, or, you know, just an, yeah, you know, tractor pattern. Half, they weren't big fish. Half pounders down there? No, no, no. This is above uh, Iron Gate. So oh, gotcha. This is, yeah, this is still in Oregon. And so, um, yeah, and so that's what we did. And then in the summertime, you know, and I'll backtrack to why I like the North Umpqua is because 1989 is when we first landed here and I was all into fly fishing and people had said, that, you know, the North Umpqua, my uh, Uncle Harvey, we called him, obviously, he he had mentioned it. And so we went camping up there in 1989 um, and I fell in love with it. I just thought it was the most beautiful place. It was so rugged. The water was just nice. You know, my mom wouldn't let me anywhere near. I was in fifth grade, you know, so yeah. I was a little guy. And she wouldn't let me anywhere near the edge of some of these places right. just because it was so right, you know, the steamboat oh, yeah. rapid, you know, I'm like, I want to walk down there. And she's like, <laughs> no, you know, <laughs> no. and so I didn't know anything about it. I didn't really fish it. Um, but we came back at least once a summer, maybe twice a summer, all through, um, like, uh, uh, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, you know, all the way to, all the way to being a senior. Um, I didn't really fish it until, I was in high school and I didn't fish it well, but yeah, we fished that. We fished the, we went and camped because Klamath Falls is just an hour and a half from, you know, the table rock area on the road. So that's where I hooked my first steelhead. But, um, yeah, we would go over and fish that stuff. And, but once we became mobile, mobile, you know, then we really started to fly fish a lot, but never with two handed rods. I didn't really start with two handed rods until, um, like 2009 Skagit master was what oh, yeah. really got me. Yeah, it was just hard to afford that stuff back then. And yep. then you to find someone to teach you. There was just a couple of videos out there, and they're pretty obscure and stuff like that. So my, my story took a kind of a roundabout way. Like, we didn't get to anywhere permanent until 1989. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't really, you know, I tied flies, but I wasn't really like a full-on, you know, angler until once I was in high school. I was selling flies to one of my biology teachers who was also a tire and a fly angler it was pretty good and my, mr shannon chuck shannon pretty cool guy um I, I was selling flies to um folks you know kids that i fished with and then their dads who helped you know get them into it because my trout flies got pretty decent not great but they looked as good as you know anything you'd see in a bin somewhere my introduction to two-handed casting was really Skagit Master. I'd seen guys doing it, and I wasn't really sure what it was all about. And someone was like, "Hey, this video." It's like 2009, and I had just moved to Eugene. Um, I was working as a firefighter for um, the BLM and the Forest mm -hmm. Service. I was a hotshot and a bunch of other different jobs in that. And I'd quit, and I was done with it. And I was moving to Eugene to finish a degree up and whatever. And so, you know, the Willamette River is a big river that is hard to one hand fish without a boat. And so, two handed casting seemed to, seemed really you know, kind of down my alley, but it was so, you know, again, it was so inaccessible, but there was Skagit Master, right? And that had just come out, I think in 2008, 2009, okay. I, I don't remember exactly, uh -huh. but right in that area, you know, it was right, right when I was, you know, going back to college. And so Ed Ward, <clears throat> watching him, you know, break all this stuff down and make it accessible to everybody was kind of my whole, yep. like, <laughs> I loved it. It was, it was so great that, that, they, that they did that. Him and Jeff Mishler put together a really good series with all those four and I love all those movies and I, uh -huh. but anyway, so moving through all that and, you know, as I was getting older and I didn't really, you know, we didn't really move around and do a lot of fishing outside of the Willamette Valley because I was playing a lot of rugby at the time and it was just very time consuming and it ate up a lot of our personal money because we spent money to travel, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you know, as, as I was finishing my degree and stuff, I, I ran across, and I don't remember what I, I don't remember what video. It was one of these videos we were talking about an OPST video. I ran across, um, like six years ago, and I was like, oh gosh, that's Ed. That's you know, and I remembered seeing Jerry French mm -hmm. on uh, Skagit Master One, and then and then I you know I saw their fly tying videos, and I went and I you know a tire first sure. as I think, you know, and a, and an angler later, and so. Um, yeah, I uh, <laughs> I saw the dirty hoe, and I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh, complete loops. And I, so I dove right in, and I started calling OPST, and I remember James Awase answered the phone, and we got to talking about tying, and he mentioned, and this is way back, this is like, this is five years, five and a half years ago, um, mm -hmm. way back, but I mean, <laughs> way back to me anyway. Sure. But um, yeah, so, and he was like, hey, <clears throat> we may be looking for guys to tie some flies for us, and 
would you ever be interested in, in something like that? You know, and I was like, perhaps. And they weren't like offering me anything at the time, obviously. You know, they'd want to look at everything I could do, but you know, just throwing it out there. And so I started talking to my lady about it. And, you know, it was kind of towards the end of my degree at the university. And I was super disillusioned with the choice that I had made. I, I got a, and I haven't actually officially finished the degree. I still have four credits. Mm-hmm. Um, my parents passed away in this little chunk of time that I was at, not, unable to do. Unable to finish that stuff oh, up, but um, anyway, like I was pretty, you know, I was wasn't really into what I was gonna do, and you know, you th- just thinking about something else. What's my other option? And you know, the only other thing I really needed was five, five four wires. And I was in my mid thirties, and that's you know, my back's all messed up from rugby, and my knee yeah. I had a knee surgery, and all that stuff. And so, like, you know, that's not an option. So the fly fishing industry started to look a lot more, um, yeah, appealing. You know, promising. Cause I could, you know, I could fly fish and fly fishing forever. So that's kind of how, you know, the idea started and it just kind of evolved from there. Like Jerry wanted to put together when Jerry was with OPSD still, he wanted to mm-hmm. put together a, a uh, fly tying gig where a bunch of guys lived in a house together and all tied for a certain number of months a year. Huh. And like, that's like kind a, of, you know, like a reality show. No, no, no. Well, I hope <laughs> not. no, but it was more, it was more like born from their experience experience on the intruder like the intruder really grew from you know a lot of influence there you know if you read deck hogan's awesome book yeah uh, uh, passion for deal he talks about ed waking him up dangling the thing in front yep. of his face going look what i did you know, yep. and, you know it was really a collaboration of ed jerry uh, you know and i'm sure you know, and please forgive me if i forget names but sure ed you know jerry french scott howe yeah uh, uh, deck hogan and i'm sure a few others had their had their hands in it and that's just that whole you know, a bunch of different really good anglers and really good tires collaborating together can create some pretty cool things. And that's what Skagit casting kind of was too. And, yep. you know, um, yeah, I think that that's kind of his idea or was, it was his idea at that point, but you know, it costed a lot of pe- people, a lot of money to uproot themselves for a certain amount of time a year, you know, to tie flies commercially and, and try to make a, try to make something like a composite loop commercially viable you know because it takes a long time to do yeah. a composite loop versus you know something else so that's kind of where i okay. first and i've never actually really met jerry <laughs> gotcha he called me and we talked about it you know uh, <laughs> so basically like, yeah. yeah so you so you can yeah uh, i mean you've kind of yeah obviously jerry was there early and uh but ultimately yeah you just kind of reached out and you kind of uh just went for it sounds like you connected with these guys yeah and, and slowly it evolved into where now you're yeah. you're working for the yeah. company Pretty much, yeah. You know, the, the the fly thing didn't really work out for him, and then uh, I just kept bugging him and said, you know, I'll help as the rep, and they know, you know, the OPSD doesn't really do, um, yep, reps in the traditional sense where you have, you know, area representatives and stuff. As if a lot of us wear different hats and do that ourselves, yeah. but you know, pro staff has been watered down down over the years, I think, in in some ways, right. um, and so we didn't want to contribute. I mean, in other ways, it's not. You know, if you're it's just, you know, it became one of these things where, yeah. you know, social media really helped try to push that whole movement there. And so we were trying not to, but yeah, so I just got lucky at one point, you know, yeah. one of our employees took off to pursue his own thing. That wasn't Jerry. Somebody else took off to pursue their own, uh, uh-huh. their own path. And, um, it was, say I was up helping at an event in, uh, Seattle, Emerald Waters Anglers has a, oh, yeah. a, a two. Yeah, and so I helped out at the event, and James took me out to dinner and said, "Hey, do you, do you want to answer emails for us?" And I said, "Sure." And that's kind of where it started a year ago. Gotcha. It's sure evolved since then, but so you've been way. on there. So you've been on there about a year. But well, yeah, just about. I mean, probably to the day. It's sometime in June. I don't remember exactly when, but it was in the first week of June. Yeah, <laughs> so no, that's cool. We're and- almost. Yeah. It's it's pretty awesome to hear. I, I was just uh, actually I got an interview coming up with uh, Jason uh, Rolf with the uh, Fly Tapes podcast, yeah. and he yeah. he's talking a little bit about you know he got his start with Emerald uh, uh, the guys up there mm-hmm. as well, and um, yeah, it's interesting. You know, everybody's got a different stories. Some people, you know, and Deck Hogan, you mentioned I had him on the podcast in episode twenty, and he <laughs> yeah, was- he actually explained that you know that thing that you mentioned about the dangling you know ed dangling the the intruder <laughs> stuff but you know yeah. everybody's got a different story and, and you know like jason i mean he's guiding now and uh, up there mm-hmm. and, and he hasn't been doing it all that long so it's not like you you have to be some you know your whole life sort of fly fisherman to do this thing i mean if you if you got the passion for it and you want to learn i think that you, you know you're showing that anybody can jump in with the you know with the biggest names and go for it yeah and you shouldn't let that like just dis- discourage you there's you know <clears throat> 
I'm pretty social. And so I'm friends with a lot of the guys that I've met in the last few years because I, you know, I haven't just been repping and I'm the operations manager at OPST, but um, okay. I haven't just the um, shows and stuff for just this time. I did some shows before that and I got to meet some of the guys, but you know, there's, there's always, you know, egos and competition involved in this sort of an industry. And so people will say, who's that guy? They, you know, he didn't, he, he never guided or yeah, whatever. Sure. You know, that's not big. It's not a big deal. Cause it no. doesn't really matter that there's a fly tire. And he ties trout flies. Mostly his name is Sun Tao. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. He, yeah. I've talked to him. Yeah. He, He's yeah. Cool. He is an amazing fly tire. Yep. He's probably only been doing it for, I think now three and a half years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's like there's this whole thing where people hate it. We're hating on him because you know he, he didn't put in his time or whatever. Who cares? Exactly. His flies are so good. So yep. you know, there's always going to be yeah. That kind of thing. I, yeah, I think, I think that's it, totally. Yeah, I think the haters. I, I was talking about that. You know, another guy. It's like I, you know, I mean, there's always going to be the haters, and uh, and actually the haters are good. You know, the haters are like you know, that's not no big Motivator. deal. Yeah, no, exactly. But uh, yeah, he he is awesome and. I'll provide uh, links for um, out to, to to him and uh, some of the other one, uh, people we talk about in this show here. I think I'm going to have this. Um, this is going to be uh, at episode. Uh, it'll be wetflyswing.com slash James will be um, will be the URL for this one. So I'll, I'll yeah have these links. But no, that's <laughs> awesome. Average. It's cool. It's a, yeah. it's a cool story. Pretty lucky, really. I am pretty lucky. It was t- it was in a weird time. Like my parents had passed away pretty co- close to each other, and. Um, you know, like I didn't really have a whole, um, I didn't really have a whole plan except yeah. for like maybe maybe try to get into the industry. So I did get pretty lucky too. I and I, I want to I want to acknowledge that like James Iwase and Ben Paul both um, took a big chance. They well, didn't, you know, totally. they did a big chance, you know. And I, so I appreciate that a lot. Yeah, and I think luck. I mean, I think you put yourself in the place to be. I think the lucky people are the ones that put in, you know, to take the chance, right? I mean, it's like yeah. if you didn't ever make that call or reach out mm-hmm. and you wouldn't be where you are. Sure. So no, sure. that's, that's cool. Uh, so yeah, I want to get into a little bit on, uh, you know, some of the, some of the products you guys have. And one of the, you know, the, the products I hear a lot about is these, uh, commando heads. And I, I've been, yeah. I've talked to, um, you know, a number of people I talked to, had an episode with Matt Clara. We were talking about single mm-hmm. hand spay and, you know, a lot of stuff. And I know you guys have some videos out there. Maybe you can explain what that's all about and, um, you know, how those are different from maybe some other lines and then, and maybe, maybe a little bit on some of the other products you guys have going. Sure. So let's just start real quick. It's, 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 it's helpful to mention, you know, what a spay cast is. And this is straight out of the horse's mouth from Ed, you know, right Mm -hmm. off of Scatmaster one, but it's a spay cast. is just a change of direction cast that uses the water, uh, you know, a water anchor to make that change of direction. And so a single spay, you're using a water anchor just a touch and go, but a water anchor to make that change of direction. And so Skagit is, you know, that as well but you use you know the entire line as your water anchor and so any momentum you've generated um setting your anchor gets as ed says is abolished (laughs) when you put the line on the water um and so our lines are that they're skagit heads but uh, you know when when skagit heads first kind of hit the market and again i'm not really sure because i think my first one was the flight like the 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 rio skagit flight i think well that was my first one you know um but there, there, there were a few out before that, and they just they weren't super successful with, um, with some of the customers, and some of the customers couldn't cast them. And I think you know when I've talked to some of these guys, um, and it wasn't Ed because I actually I only email Ed. I don't actually get the, I don't get a lot of FaceTime with Ed. Uh-huh. So, um, you know, but this is this is the story that I've gotten is, you know, as people were trying to cast that that continual motion, you know, a Skagit cast doesn't necessarily have to be fast or slow, but it has to stay the same speed from the moment you start mm-hmm. moving your rod tip until you stop. Um, the lines were just hard for people to cast because, you know, coming from either a touch-and-go spay background or even just a simple, you know, overhand casting background, there's a pause built into all those casts, and it's muscle memory, and it's the way a human brain works. You just pause when you're thinking about this stuff or, you know, allowing your rod to fully, you know, load or whatever. That's how the – that's how – most people had, they had that muscle memory in their, you know, ingrained in their casting stroke. So mm-hmm. they were pausing and the D loop falls out of the back, you know, falls out of the back and you, know, you don't have a loaded D loop. And so what folks did at some of these, with some of these lines, they made them longer and heavier. And that 
allowed the rod to stay loaded through the paws. The momentum of the grain weight would keep that mm -hmm. rod loaded. And so that's a grain cast. That's a Skagit cast that relies – and I, you know, percentages are tough to yeah. start throwing out there and saying it's a percentage of this or that. But I would say that there's – you know, grain, grain weight plays more of an important role in some of those style casts when you, you know, some Scott Howell, I fished with Scott yeah. on the North Umqua one day and he was helping with my, helping me with my casting and he calls it scandit casting where people pause and then go because it's kind of a hybrid mm -hmm. to, in his mind, you know, mm -hmm. and so um, the lines were getting longer and heavier and I think like the very first Skagit head ever made that Ed put together um, was like 18 feet or something and so they were never supposed to be as long yeah. as I think they, and so um, I think that's kind of where the impetus to make our lines the way they are came from is to, to try to try to keep to that original, as we call it, pure Skagit. And so there's water loaded Skagit casts and then there's grain loaded Skagit mm -hmm. casts. And then, you know, so for me, like if I'm fishing a 25 foot head, I can cast that with part of my head, not even on the water. You know, if I do a double spay or something, yeah. I don't have two feet of my head can be off the water and I can still execute a cast with a, with my, with my, with our commando heads, I put the entire head on the water, and I'm relying on the water load. So our, you know, our, our our lines are shorter, but they're a little heavier per foot, and they're fatter, and so they, um, you know, create a, a larger water load into your rod. And just as a point of just a point of example, I uh, I have a Scott L2H. It's a great big third. Well, not great, but great big to me. Mm -hmm. um, Thirteen foot rod. I know some guys swing seventeen foot. Huh. Yeah lumber and that's just i don't even know what to do with something <laughs> like that but um you know uh 13 foot rod i was fishing a 600 grain skagit max short i think it was um 600 grains that's a lot and i was yeah. to turn over you know i'm fishing on a certain spot in north on the north umqua that's deep and you do kind of a broadside rise hybrid you know presentation where you you know have a really long uh, leader and you know, a heavy fly that sinks through the leader and t17 it's it's not the most it's like the one like one or two places you fish like that there yep. but um at 600 grains was what i was using to turn that over and on that same rod and that same rig you know the 7 to 13 or 12 feet of t17 and then the long leader heavy fly i'm using a 475 grain commando head so that's 125 grains less mm -hmm. um and so i'm getting that load somewhere and it's from the water. I'm getting, you know, on a, and it's, you know, am I actually getting 125 grains worth of water load? I don't know. But I'm getting a lot more than I normally do. And so that's kind of the idea. Um, they also have kind of a forward taper that helps carry the momentum out. If you look at how a dart is shaped, you know, it's got the weight in the front to help, you know, carry it into the dartboard. So that's kind yeah. of the gotcha. that's kind of what the lines are. And, and because they're short and we have 12 lines and, you know, our shortest two are 12 feet. Huh. And then our 200 grain series that goes that fits on you know anywhere from three to well 200 grain series goes five up but I mean, our, our one 100 our 150 grain to 275 grain fits you know one handed rods really well okay. uh, three weights to eight weights yeah. with some wiggle room on either side you know and then because they're short and so that mm -hmm. makes them you know they're not specifically and this is a question that I typically get um, on on emails or phone calls and they're not specifically made for one-handed rods they just happen to work really well on them because of their design and their length and mm -hmm. so that's kind of you know that's uh, gi giving email questions answer answers to email questions when i'm you know just working that's one of my major jobs okay. that i do for is i answer all the emails gotcha. and pass up, pass up the ones that are over my head but i'm huh. probably i would say 75 percent are one-handed rod questions uh-huh People wow. that want to get a one-handed rod, you know, the, everyone's got a one-handed rod. Yeah. Uh, in the in the closet, and sure. you know, a bunch of us. If you're anything like me, I went, I was deep. I didn't even I I didn't even look back. I my first spay rod was I think the the Z axis, and it was like, super expensive. It was way out of my price uh -huh. range when I was a college student and <laughs> using my financial aid right. to pay for it. Oh yeah. Bad. But um, yeah. So you know, like I had all these one-handed rods that were just kind of just defunct i didn't use them anymore and then trout spay really really started to mess that up because then i started buying the you know four weights and three weight mm -hmm. switches and spays and all these other rods sat in the corner and i was kind of late to the game on the one-handed sketchet thing i was just uh -huh. like uh you know i got all these two-handed rods i spent all this money on and but now i really like it and it's huh. um cool. i think a lot of you know no one has to no one has to go out and buy a even a 
you know, the, you know, a low end rod is still a couple hundred bucks when you're talking in the two hundred range. So exactly, cool. And and you're uh, yeah. and are you guys selling? You get a lot of questions. Do you guys sell a lot of uh, some of those lines? You know, uh, equal amount of lines, or how does that compare to the the bigger, heavier stuff? Or is it still kind of based on more of the heavy stuff? Well, I think it kind of goes in. Uh, it kind of goes in seasons, you know, when winter steelhead season, we do definitely sell more of the 300 grain lines and up, but like, you know, when trout season comes in, you know, we can, we can get kind of close to the bottom of the barrel as far as like running out of the, you know, 200 to 275 grain heads, because a lot of people are buying them, um, you know, and that's, that's been a challenge. But, um, I think that I, I, I don't know, like, I don't actually see the sales data, but I mm-hmm. suspect just based on my just looking at the emails, I would say that that's probably our biggest seller is the trout stuff. Oh, and, well, um, yeah. The 200. Yeah. And it would right? make, because it yeah. goes back to everybody. So, yeah. Um, yeah and does. we have the, the, you know, tips that, that, that work with them really well. We've got, you know, some stuff that's cut shorter and lighter to accommodate one hand rods that, you know, if you go to some of these other tips, you got to cut. If, if, if you don't want to, if you don't want to have to adjust your casting stroke and cast a 10 foot tip, you got to cut stuff back. I know Airflow's got some stuff that's mm-hmm. um, different size stuff like that, but you know, it's just yeah. We really like the you know our, my general manager Ben Paul. He loves one-handed casting. You mm-hmm. know, probably more than anybody I've ever met. And he's you know you've seen his videos. Yeah, excuse me. He's obviously like I think probably one of the best single-handed skagit casters in the uh, that I've ever seen. Yeah, I've seen. You know, and that's and it, it just it's fun. That's yeah. the that's the kicker. Is yeah. I can get a lot more distance. Even the North Umpqua doesn't have a lot of room for a back cast. Yeah, you know, totally, totally. You know, I've I've watched a few of Ben's videos, and yeah, they are they are pretty, uh, definitely pretty good. Um, so, what is the you know thinking about? Uh, so, you guys do you know you mentioned Skagit. Do you guys have a line that's that you could fish for summer steelhead, or do you kind of stay away from the summer? Well, steelhead? sure. You know, you just put a if you want to fish a Skagit system with a floating presentation, and I do. You know, I fish, I swing with a floating line a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, just, you know, again, I keep going back to where I fish a lot. I go to the north. You know, you can't use weighted flies. You can use a sink tip in the summer, but that's that's worse than using a weighted fly. <laughs> You're going to mm-hmm. get deeper. And so we use dry lines. So you have, you know, all gadget casts require a tip of some sort. But they, they have, you know, floating mo tips, and we have our, you know, 5 foot, 7 and a half foot, and 10 foot floating we call them micro skagit tips because they're, you know, really made for the, you know, 150 to 275 grain okay. heads. We're going to be releasing some some other tips um, that are going to be more conducive for two-handed summer steelhead. We've got like a, the one I'm messing around with right now is a 90 grain 12 foot tip, and so there's a bunch of different stuff that we're going to come out with as far as a floating tip option for swinging um, for summer steelhead. And you know, one of my favorite kind of and I don't know if I'm actually, you know, accomplishing it, but it's, you know, the grease line presentation is uh-huh. just a, is just a great, great way to hook fish, especially with a riffle hitch fly. And, mm-hmm. you know, in some of the places I fished, it's, 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 it's one of the most effective techniques you can, you can use. Um, line control is essential in a grease line, you know, yep. kind of that's line controls. What, and I, I feel like with a long floating tip, and a short skagit head and then you know the mono running line <clears throat> where i don't have line on the water to mess to, to to be to be caught up in the current um it works out great and i you know i've caught uh, several fish dry line you know just the way you would dry line swing or, or grease line swing okay. with a longer floating tip and so it works out good Our floating tips are tapered so um mm-hmm. they land a little bit more delicately than like a level gotcha. floating tip yeah. yeah. Okay. That's what I was thinking. I was, I was picturing a, yeah, yes, a heavier, you know, cause I've used some of the heavier, uh, Skagit lines where, you know, on the, for <laughs> summers and stuff. And yeah, it's like a big fat garden hose out there. You don't get the, <laughs> you don't get the subtleness yeah. of, the, of some of the Scandi type yeah. lines, but, uh, yeah, that, that's good stuff. Um, so what is the, ba- yeah, what's that? Thing, you know what I, mean? I don't think that's as important as people think with steelhead, especially like I know some spooky fish and you know, if I'm, if you're fishing, you know, clear water, not clear water river, but, you know, a, a river with very clear water and heavily pressured fish yeah. like the North Umpqua, you know, presentation is a little bit more important there than say, you know, 
the Willamette River with the with the with the jet boats ripping over these right. fish that actually right. make them, you know, the jet boats make them eat. Oh, <laughs> really? get all agitated. oh yeah. They get agitated. People get mad when the jet boats come by and we get back in the water huh. and start swinging through no the waves kidding. because they'll push those fish off that, off that high bank, you know, and move uh-huh. them back into the run a little bit because they get pounded on that river. You know, yeah. they, that's a, that's a meat fishery huh. and it get and it's oh, fish. Right. Stuff. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, how do you, you know, catch fish? Uh, so you're saying meat fishery. So you're fishing behind like uh, gear guys. Yeah, well, it's a hatchery. You know, the Dexter hatchery right at the dam is a mitigation hatchery for the dam complex. Yep. The for, well, I forget when the Willamette complex went in. I believe it's in the fifties or sixties or something. Fifties or sixties. Yeah, yep. I should know that off the top of oh, my head. My yeah. college professor, you're listening to this, or they're gonna be <laughs> mad. But um, so. That's all. Even even if you catch a fish with a fin there, you're legally allowed to harvest it because it's thought to be a Fall Creek sure. feral fish. So it's wild, gotcha. but and we don't because they, you know, it could just as easily be a Sandy M stray, right? You know, and so we obviously release those fish because I would, I, I don't know, I, I, I just, yeah. it's got a fin on it, I can't kill it. But if it, you know, it's but that lot. that's a that's a meat fishery. You know, the, the people go and fill their freezer up there on good years in 2016 i think it was i mean we could hit the river at th- two in the afternoon and start catching fish this is in the fall when the fish kind of mm-hmm. get more active but we would catch five or six fish a piece from three o'clock till dark hmm. or two o'clock till dark right. you know in the fall and put some numbers up and man i had a neighbor that fell in hard times and 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 we ended up filling his freezer huh. one fall with, with fish just because it was so available, yeah. you know, and so, that is, you know, and, but it's, but it's heavily fished by gear anglers and there's, gotcha. you know, all the problems up with the so crowded what, river. But um, what's your secret, uh, catching fish behind gear anglers are, do you fish differently than you would if there were no, nobody fishing there with gear? Yeah, no, I think that just trying to do something different, you know, and that's not just gear anglers. That's, you know, a busy day on the North Umpqua. If everybody's chugging flies across the surface and they're beating the water to a froth, you know, with yep. the, the rogue river, which they call it or whatever, mm-hmm. um, you know, swing a muddler, grease line a muddler. <laughs> yeah. No one's doing that. No one's doing and that. On that. And that's kind of what I kind of think about with gear anglers, you know, I, I gotcha. swinging flies behind gear anglers. You know, a lot of times these guys are throwing spinners, but a lot of times these guys are fishing uh, row or they're fishing. Uh, yeah sand shrimp and side drifting and stuff like that and i got a funny story there's a in, in my buddies that fish these runs even though these aren't secret fisheries i won't name them because they'll probably send me angry sure. letters but um <laughs> fishing a, a you know the hatchery rivers are known to you know wherever they reacclimate the small six runs below that and six runs above that are two that's the prevailing wisdom anyway as i've been taught it i think it was in john larison's um uh, what's that called the complete steel letter oh, yeah, i think totally, yeah. yeah yeah he talks about that you know on hatchery runs which we deal with all up and down the west coast do you know where they reacclimate the smolts you know a few runs below it and a few runs above it mm-hmm. are probably full of fish and this is one of those scenarios but it's not even above or below it's actually at the acclimation site and everybody knows where this is mm-hmm. and so um there's a boat launch on the on river right and we're fishing river left because we have you know foot access that way and um a boat comes in and my buddy dan hooks a fish on the top of the run loses it but the boat sees us as it's coming down with a fish on and so they park and i, I could have hit him i could have hit him with my with and i'm and i'm fishing an intermediate sinking tip and a very light i don't even think it was weighted it had a had like a plastic cone or something on it but it was a really really small fly um I could have hit him i could have hit the guy in the back of the head he parked so close to us oh. at, like on our side right sure. downstream because that's the you know in Jeez. his mind the fish stacked all along that bank, which is not true. In that particular run, they're spread. It's narrow at the top, and so they're more concentrated. But they spread all through that, and you know you'll see guides post up and they'll just boat swing that where they just sit in the front of the boat and throw a one hander as far as you can throw it hmm. with whatever fly on the end, and they swing it from the boat. Mm-hmm. Um, but the guys right there and they're. I don't know. I, I, I kind of felt bad because he almost fell in, but he was standing up doing something. I hooked a fish behind the boat. Oh, wow. And it was right next to the boat behind it. And the fish splashed real hard <laughs> and threw water in the boat. And the guy was like, whoop, whoop. And he grabbed the yeah. edge of the boat and about, about fell out. I didn't want to do that. That was not my intention. <laughs> you know, yeah. I I don't, it, it, yeah, totally. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, that's kind of the fishery there. That's um, cool. 
That's cool. And so fishing behind those guys to think you just just do what you're doing, but you know, if they're dra- you know, if they're dragging something like a, a spoon or a blue fox spinner, a spinner, you know, maybe go with something a little bit more subtle. I catch a lot of fish on that river and purple and black, you know, or okay. something subtle, something subtle because they're not throwing subtle anything. No. It's either a gobble bait or a big flashing spoon, and that stuff works good. Yep. But you know, I yeah, try to you know just be different. It's interesting because. Uh, you know, there's, you know, there's no one way to do anything. And, uh, you know, Tom Larimer was talking about, uh, um, yeah. you know, on his, that was a good, yeah, totally on, I can't remember what episode it was, but a while back, uh, maybe episode 11, but he, uh, and it's totally different. I mean, he mentioned that, you know, uh, fishing in the daytime, he's trying to get these fish, you know, summer steelhead where most people aren't fishing and he's going, he's trying yeah. to Im- imitate the gear guys. So, you know, obviously that's totally different. And the funny thing is I <laughs> had, uh, Scott McGarvod as well, like in a later episode in Scott, yeah. It, you know, so yeah, you heard that one. And Scott basically said, basically, you know, kind of called out Tom, didn't call him out, but basically said, hey, I heard that episode with Tom doing the summer steelhead, but he said, you know, guarantee nine times out of 10, if he's up here fishing the, you know, the Skeena with me, he's going to be fishing it slow and doing all the things you're talking about, you know, kind of subtle. And so, it well, it's a sense. different river. Yeah. And that's the thing. That's, that's why I love Tom. And I actually talked to Tom a little bit and I didn't get a chance to tell him about listening to the listening to the podcast because okay. i haven't used that's that's spawned like a like a presentation he gives oh right one. he gave it a, yeah he gave one at royal treatment and you know how he's you know how he's i don't know if that's the the, the podcast in general yeah spawn that or what but um you know it's something he's done and he was given a, a talk at royal treatment fly shop up there in uh-huh. westland um the same day i was doing a demo a oh, fly cool. tying demo and uh i heard bits and pieces of it and then i listened to the um podcast it's really interesting the willamette river is also set up like the deschutes where it runs from oh, south yeah. to north and into the that's right so you know we we have the the, the bulk of the run comes in early and, and you know uh, uh and this is a jay nicholas uh, uh-huh. this jay nicholas explained a long time ago when i was still getting my degree and it really really stuck and it helps you know when you're thinking about run timing you know a a, a run of any anadromous fish steelhead or whatever is a bell curve you know, yep. that's what it looks like on a graph is a bell curve. And so, you know, some of them are broad bell curves and some mm-hmm. of them are really narrow bell curves. And it's based on, you know, if they're hatchery fish or wild fish. Yep. So, you you know, in the Willamette, we get a bunch of fish in and then they trickle in all summer when it's hot. And there's a bu- they're there. They're just not eating because the water warms up, the water drops. Mm-hmm. And, you know, how you talk to Trey Combs. And this is where I've kind of gotten this idea while listening to some of his presentations over the years. Mm-hmm. But um, water temperature is so important for fish. And it, summer fish and winter fish are two completely different. They're totally different animals, but they're very much driven by water temperature. And so those fish aren't really as active in warm water. They wait for it to cool off in the fall. And that's when we end up getting those five fish days. You know, mm-hmm. They're there the whole time. And so I'm thinking to myself, maybe Tom – maybe Tom's uh, way of doing things is something that we need to look at, you uh-huh. know, and catch these fish in the middle of the day, because, you know, there are gear guides that do go out and fish all yep. through the, you know, July and August. And I usually leave the river alone until, um, you know, it's easier totally. to catch the fish. I don't want to work hard for hatchery fish. I'll work real hard for one wild fish. Yep. Like they've been ridiculous amounts of money, but my license fee is the only money you're getting out of the hatchery fish. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not going to put it to yeah. Yeah, no, it's cool. That's uh, yeah, I think in the yeah, the water temperature obviously is a big thing. And on the Deschutes, yeah, you you'll have some warm water temperatures definitely midday. So Gosh. if if Tom's hooking up, that. yeah, exactly, exactly. yeah, Where's, totally. Um, no, this is great. I, I think we've we've dug into some good stuff here. I I was thinking about you know just kind of the back how you started this off with the travel. I was curious. I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, some of that travel, so basically you traveled all around the world with your family you yeah. know, and that whole thing. I mean, what, what did that whole, um, you know, process, what, what, what did that kind of teach you, you know, about life and kind of, has it helped you kind of <laughs> where you're at now and, and where you're, you know? Yeah. It's a funny story. I actually tell a lot, um, because yeah, I'm from a small town and I'm not particularly conservative, although I don't have any problem with folks that are or mm-hmm. whatever, but I've just, you know, I've had friends that I grew up with down in Klamath Falls, like how come you're not like me <laughs> kind of thing. And oh, yeah. there's a story I tell, and it was when we lived in the Philippines, um, we went to, and I can't remember the city that my sister was adopted out of. Um, but 
the orphanage is the orphanage or whatever the building well i don't it didn't say orphanage on it and even if it did i was like five or six and so i don't remember all the details but anyway we had gone there a couple of times because it's a process to adopt a child my sister yeah. and uh brother actually she adopted a little boy from uh nor or south korea hmm. um and so I, were, I watched her and her husband go through that process. It's pretty intense. But anyhow, so we were going through that process as a family. And um, we went there one day. And mom and dad were inside. And so because uh, because my dad was gone so much, he was an officer in the military and in the Air Force. And they would give us uh, or, or not give us. I guess that's the wrong way to put it. Mm-hmm. But they would they would, you know, we, we had a, a live in made that the that the Air Force paid for hmm. that kind of. Wow you know, help my mom with all the stuff. Cause there was, you know, me and you know, whatever my, my dad was gone. So, um, we had a, she was actually Spanish. She was a Spanish lady from Spain. Um, and so she was standing outside with me while my mom and dad were inside, like doing whatever they needed to do paperwork or I'm not mm-hmm. sure, but we're, you know, going to bring my sister home the next week. And to me, she was my sister already. Cause my mom and dad had told me I was adopted and I was like, cool. Yep. And then, you know, then we're going to adopt, you know, you're going to have a sister. And so I was, I was at the, you know, whatever the adoption area was, the orphanage, whatever, whatever it was. But there was kids that weren't in there that they didn't have room for. I found out later, but they were drinking out of a puddle (laughs) and they were like, you know, the way you out of the way you drink out of a a dirty puddle where you swirl the water to move the, you know, and that's, that's, you know, sediment out so you don't actually drink a parasite or something. Mm -hmm. And I just was really struck by the fact that we were going to adopt my sister and these kids are drinking out of a puddle. And so for me, that was really stark and defining because you, 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 when you live on an air base, you live in small town USA. Like that is not a, they don't, an air base is not a place where they bring in outside ideas (laughs) or anything like that. It's very small town USA. And so that's kind of the idea I had in my head of what things should be like and i was young you know five six i think is when we i was six because we actually picked her up we, we brought her home the next you know in a couple of days after but you know as a six-year-old seeing like it's just blind luck you know mm-hmm. absolute blind luck that my sister and i ended up in klamath falls oregon growing up on the river yep you know throwing flies for trout or steelhead later and then other kids were drinking out of a puddle and there was no difference other than the luck of circumstance of where they were born and, and who their parents were. And it just really struck me as something that um, should be examined over a lifetime. You know, why, yeah. <laughs> why is yeah. it that these structures are in place and we can get into something that is way too far away from fishing. And sure. so I'm not going to die <laughs> or down into it, but yeah. that really did shape kind of like everything about like, you know, my degree in environmental studies that I actually don't have. So please don't, I, I'm right. four credits away, but you know, and all yep. those decisions were just based kind of on this, like some people have all of it and some people have none of it and that's not okay. And we got to fix that somehow. And that was kind of, mm-hmm. you know, that was really a defining moment, but just being able to go to different places and see, you know, I'm a really adventurous eater. If it's not moving, I'll probably put it in my mouth, especially if it's out of the ocean. Really? What about, so, uh, that, what about a big, uh, a salmon fly on the, on, off the river. I've eaten. I've not eaten a salmon fly. I've done. I've done caddis flies. I did an October caddis fly. Do not recommend that. Really? Yeah. They oh, pop. that's right. They pop. Oh, I bit down and it was pow, and I was like, whoo! It that's was right. you know in my twenties. And they're kind of fishing. furry. They're kind of hairy too, aren't they? A little yeah, bit. they're fuzzy and it's, yeah. they're a moth. You know, oh, that's God. What it is. Oh, <laughs> essentially ate a moth. Yeah, that was not cool. In our twenties, we were pretty pretty wild. You know, there was oh, yeah. rugby. There was fire, for, forest firefighting. There was a oh, lot yeah. of we read a lot of Hunter S. Thompson, and uh-huh. so our fishing trips really kind of mirrored that. It wasn't really about the trip; no. it was about where it wasn't about the fish. It was about the trip, kind of a thing, and how we how we approached it. But yeah, so we ate some bugs, but I don't know if I could do the salmon fly again. If it's dead, maybe. Yeah. But if it's still yep. moving, I have a problem. Yeah, but I've yeah, got I've a some weird stuff. I've got a good friend. <laughs> I've got a good friend, uh, Shannon, one of my right. fishing buddies, and he he uh, yeah he he likes eating salmon flies. So I'm, I'm call, mm. calling them out a little bit here. It's uh, yeah they're crunchy, man. I've never done it, but they're de- they're definitely big. well. It's that that juice. I mean, when you hold them, they have some sort of they excrete excrete some sort of a like a yellowish something, and that's bitter. Yeah, like I've had it on my hands oh, and tasted yeah. it, and that's bitter. That's like it. bitter's not my 
if I if I if I could pick one flavor, I'm not into is bitter. <laughs> exactly. Sour, I'm okay with bitter. Meh. I hear. You. <laughs> I hear. You. Yeah, this uh, this is good. Man, our conversation is uh, taking a little bit of a turn, but uh, no, I, I think okay. that, I think this is uh, this is good stuff. Um, you know, I think yeah. like you said, your the question I had on on travel, I think obviously it's uh, you know it's. Sounds like to me it, it's made you, uh, you know, a better person. And I think that's, I think that's a struggle for a lot of people, especially Americans, you know, and, and I'm probably just as bad as any that, you know, don't get out there and travel as much that, man, when you see the rest of the world and you see what's going on out there, you, you definitely change your mindset and probably appreciate what we have a little more and maybe don't get fired up and, you know, road rage and these, the little things, right? I mean, there's a lot of crazy <laughs> bad stuff going on and, yeah. and we should appreciate what we have. And, and yeah. And like you said, help, help other people in other countries. Yeah. Well, and just here, but I just think, you know, for me that there was, you know, I got so much out of my life experiences and especially angling. Like I was crazy. I was a crazy kid. Like we ran around, drank too much. Got, I mean, it's climate falls. Like, Oh yeah. If you didn't drink oh, yeah. beer and get in a fist fight, it's like you were weird. Huh. And so we were, we were, we were nuts, you know, and a lot of that, a lot of that got tempered by, and I don't know if it's a hundred percent true when people say, if you teach your kids to fish, they won't have enough money for a drug or right. drugs and alcohol. Right. I don't know if that's true or not. But um, it definitely helped focus us, you know, me especially, um, into like a, you know, away from away from some of the bad influence, especially Klamath, man. There's a there's a lot of well, and that's everywhere in yeah, Oregon. Yeah. You know, I can't just take Klamath because every oh, time you look at the rest, arrest reports in Eugene, there's a lot of meth and all that stuff. You know, I mean, kids that get into fishing, you know, sometimes they go down the wrong path too. one of my fishing partners actually. A really good friend of mine that I fished with for years and years. Um, he took his own life. Um, oh wow! In the yeah, right when I first moved to Eugene, because he'd gotten into that stuff pretty hard. And so you know, that's that yeah. it can happen to anybody. But I feel like if you have positive influences like the outdoors or sports, that you know, I don't like the idea that no. fishing or sports builds character. You know, your parents build character. You exactly. It just you know, fishing reveals it, right? And I've thrown my rod in the water yep. like an idiot before. Oh, frustration yeah. or you know, and so it helps, I think, to help continue to mold the character that people try to build in you. Gotcha. So that's what, yeah, yeah. what I like no, about it. You know? No, those are great. That's a, a great conversation. Yeah, maybe uh, we meet up for a beer here some, you know, eventually or whatever. We could have a go a little deeper into all this. I'd love to love to tie a few flies with you as well. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. Um, so, yeah, I was going to bring yeah, it back, bring it back a little bit back to uh, Steelhead and you know, we talked mm -hmm. about little tips. Do you have, uh, you know, a good steelhead tip for somebody if maybe we're talking about? I guess we haven't really got your home river. It sounds like your home river is either the, the Mackenzie or Willamette, or what, what do you consider your home river? Um, so that's the, you know, I don't really consider any place home because of how much I travel. Yeah. You know, and even after I graduated high school, I went to the, I, I, I spent one year on a contract crew, then I went and became oh, yeah. a hotshot, and I lived in Northern California, and God, I've been hmm. all over. I've fire in every state that has fire pretty so you're, much so and you're so, continuing the the life of traveling with your dad i mean it sounds like you're you're kind of continuing that a little bit yeah yeah and it wasn't really intentional i went to southern oregon university and i wasn't ready to go to college and i love rugby and i played it when i would lived overseas and i couldn't really, really play a lot when i first you know not until high school did i have an opportunity to go somewhere you know and play a little but um i just went full just full bore on the rugby and the beer and the, yep. you know, the studying took uh, the studying took it back and so I flunked out I flunked out uh -huh. at SOU and I won't I mean I, well I guess I could tell you what my GPA was it's <laughs> the lowest GPA you've ever heard yeah it was it was a point three three wow it was ridiculous I, I passed like one class and so I was <laughs> obviously not only I was eighteen years old I wasn't mature enough no. to handle you know, life alone or whatever no. so I you know needed something to do my dad was like you should fight forest fires there you that go. straighten you out and I'm like yeah I went to my first fire and I thought it was the worst thing I'd ever done huh and I swore to God I'd never do it again and then like eight years later I finally stopped but um oh, yeah wow. so I went all over doing that and you know I got to fish a lot um. I got to fish a lot in you know, on the winter time and stuff. And so, um, steelhead for me really was, a kind of a, it was a mystery. You know, I caught my first one on the rogue, um, over, you know, just over, over the hill in the, in the, mm -hmm. I call it the table rock area, but it was above table rock, but, um, you know, and, and I didn't, I didn't even really knew what I had caught. It was just, hmm. to, you know, I thought it was just, it was 1994 and I, you know, took, my parents took a quick, you know, picture of it. 
and mm-hmm. um, the, there's a there's I wouldn't I'd hesitate to call it a fly shop. But there's a, 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 a outdoor store in Klamath Falls called Parker's Run. Gunrag Gene Parker was the mm-hmm. owner. His son Dave owns it still. Um, and uh, I brought the photo in. You know, once this is back when you had to get things developed at Walmart or wherever. I don't even think we had a Walmart then. We didn't have a Walmart, but <laughs> you had to go somewhere to get it to get it developed. And I brought the picture in and. And Gene goes, that's a nice steelhead. And I was like, what? Yeah. That's a steelhead. And I knew they were there. I just didn't know, you know, yeah. how was to it, catch it. This how, was in high school. Was it a uh, like a half pounder or was this a, a – No, it was an adult. Yeah. It was probably four or five. I mean, you know, yeah, not the, huge. The, the adults there aren't much bigger. Gotcha. They're one of my favorite races of fish, though, just those one-year fish, that one salt kind of uh-huh. just trouty and aggressive, and they fight hard. And I couldn't believe it. You know, I mean, it was obviously a different – fish then you know i and i wasn't really well versed in what was where i just got lucky it was the fall you know and the fish was there and mm-hmm. um i was swinging a soft tackle for trout and i just happened to not you know i think i was using six pound test or something so he didn't come off um and i released him and i was super excited and and, and gene was like that was a cool fish the girl cool steelhead you caught and i was like it was a steelhead huh? and so then that's where it started that's seen you know, on my email oh, address is steel 94 because oh, 94 gotcha. is when it started and i was saved ruined all I like to say, and I think it was a line that John Gearak wrote that uh-huh. I've, I've I've commandeered, but it's saved and ruined all at the same time is what I like to call it because I really was. Uh, I, I mean, yep. I became I had to come back from steelhead. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, I was a steelheader for a while, and I just didn't fish for anything else. And I love all these other fish so much, but I was really trying to just become a better steelheader. And I thought that the more I fished for him, or the harder I fished for him. I would get to, you know, some people have said, like, on the North Umqua, the magic number for a good angler is one fish per day. And I don't know anybody that does that. I have that, I, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know anybody that does that. I've lucked out and had multiple fish days there, but sure. I've also gone through an entire winter and not caught anything. And that was yeah. last winter even. So, um, you know, I think that steelhead for me was more of a roundabout thing because there was so much trout fishing. Klamath Falls is running Klamath Lake. Oh, yeah, we it's have huge. 14 pound rainbows yep. that are not not uncommon that's not a weird thing you know that's like no. oh you found you found a big one right and you know and in and, and, and the keno stretch of the klamath river when i was in high school they netted they did a like an electroshock net yep. survey and they net a 20 pound rainbow in there Damn. and you'll never catch that fish no, i mean you'd have to fish no. the night with but, half a sucker but yeah essentially so it's, was, it's the ocean i mean that's just kind of like the great lakes similarly it's the uh the those, those big la- they're huge i mean klamath lakes are in there and that's their ocean right yep. Yeah, for sure. And they, you know, there's some, you know, some folks have said they used to, there, there was an anadromous race before. Yeah. Um, and I could believe it sure. because, you know, they go, they, summer steel had do travel quite far, not winter fish, but, um, so. Totally. Well, and the interesting maybe, thing, the they, interesting uh, thing about rainbow trout that a lot of people don't know is that there's a lot of, um, you know, overlap. There's rainbow resident rainbow fish that become, you know, uh, anadromous based on environmental conditions mm-hmm. and vice versa. So you got, you know, they're the same species, right? They're, they're the same species. So there's no, uh, no they're all on my yep. That's the yep. thing. But when yep. you, but not, so I've gotten into this debate with great lakes anglers and it's turned ugly. And I don't mm. mean to make it sound like these fish aren't amazing because they are, Oh yeah. but they're not anadromous. And, and, and I forget what the name for a lake run fish is, but so rainbow trout have an incredible, array of life histories and so yeah. i use this example you have two fish say you got a couple of fish on the um uh, what's a river that's got yeah well, let's just use let's just use the north uncle i got a couple of fish spawning in steamboat creek or up at the big yeah. bend or where and you know they're both anadromous they both came back from the ocean not all of those fish that come up out of their red and hatch out of their red are going to become anadromous some of them stay and just become yeah. resident rainbow trout they mm-hmm. all came out of the same red that was made by two anadromous steelheads. So, you know, it's pretty complicated. And, and I don't know. Biologists know a lot more, especially fish fisheries guys know a lot more about this than I do. Because my education is, you know, restoration and um, uh, policy. Um, totally. Community-based totally. resource management. So think like uh, watershed councils type, type stuff. So, you know, the science, I'm not a completely – an authority on, but yeah, they, they don't, there's so much difference between just what some of these fish become out of the same red that it's really hard to say, like, I don't, you know, I don't like it when people bash on uh, great Lakes steelhead cause they're cool fish, you know, and they do have that parent heritage, but yeah. something about the salt. Yeah. Well, it's because, a different, you know, it's a different system. And, yeah. Once those fish in the great lakes get certain size, 
they don't have predators. There's no otters out there or there's nothing out there eating. Yeah. They're just yeah. kind of, and I know I wouldn't, I hesitate to put them at the top of the food chain. Cause you know, that's not really how we think of things anymore, but, um, you know, in the ocean, <laughs> a 30 pound, st- I, I caught a, you know, I caught a 20 some pound fish on the North Umpqua a couple of springs ago when I was fishing with Scott Howe and, mm-hmm. um, he was guiding me. I should actually clarify. I did hire him for the day, but, um, <laughs> you know, that fish had a chunk taken out of its tail from a, from a sea lion. Like that's a big fish. That fish in the great lakes doesn't have a chunk taken out of its tail from anything. Once no. it's big enough to be, you know, and so I think that, if, I think that influences them a little bit, you know, they get attacked from the top, from the sides, from yeah. the bottom, you know, and I, and that's yeah. why I think well, they're curious. I will, I will say, and I've never fished the great lakes, so I don't know, but, um, you know, I did interview Pete Humphreys, I think in episode seven, and he's a big Michigan guy. Yeah. And he did yeah. say, you can listen to that interview. And he said, you know, you could hear, you could hear his passion about what he feels and he's fished the skiing. He's fished everything all around too. And he feels like those sure. fish coming yeah. out of there are just as aggressive and just as powerful as any, you know, any fish that he's fished for. So I don't know. I think yeah. that, I think you, you make good points for sure on predator, the predator prey relationship and things like that. But it, like, I think the main point and is I, that uh, every basin is oh, different. <laughs> What's that? I don't know. Really? Those are, they're fine fish. And I, I think that it's definitely, we have a lot of customers over there. We've got, yeah. um, have you fished the uh, over there? Have you fished Those the are, uh, the, uh, the Great Lakes system? No, and it's so much on my bucket list. Like yep. I'm so that's one of the biggest things I'm excited about working with OPSC is oh, yeah. Dave Pinsky and that whole connection over there because I really want to do it. I think they're amazing fish. I think they're different. And what is different P- what is, is Pinchkowski? What, what what would he say about it? Um, you know, I, I mean, I don't, actually, I don't want you to speak for, speak for him. But. Facebook a long time ago. No, before anybody knew anything about me, nobody really knows anything about me now. And it's probably a good well, thing. Well, they, they um, will now, man. Yeah. Now you're, you're, you're <laughs> oh, famous here. <laughs> yeah. I hope no. not. Um, so, you know, the, they're, they're, they're different, but that doesn't make them not as good. And I think that's where the, the conversation goes is when, when, you know, there's some arrogance to being a steelheader in, in some circles. Like, you know, you're kind of a, it's a weird subculture from a weird sub, because spy fishermen are a weird subculture to begin with. Right. And then you want to make them weird or talk about someone that's going to stand in the middle of the river while his yep. wading jacket is frozen solid, solid from, you know, sleet and ice. That's, yep. you know, my that's parents, weird. when they were still alive, really never got it. Huh. Cause we only fish in the summer and they were like, what are you doing? Like, that's dangerous. And I'm like, well, I don't know about how dangerous it is, but it's fun. And I think that, you know, there's people that really glam onto that, you know, there's a, almost an elitism that can come, come from it sometimes. And I don't like that. And I think yeah. that that's kind of where the conversation with, you know, West coast steelhead versus, um, great Lakes steelhead come is, you know, there's, there's a little bit of, well, you know, ours are real steelhead. And they're all anchoring because my kiss, that's the thing. They're all trout, yep. <laughs> all of them, totally. they're all rainbow trout and they just have different life histories and they're all fascinating life histories and they're all that's amazing. Right. We have lake run fish. Those lake run fish out of the great lakes are, some of them are slot pigs. I mean, they're real gaggers. I've huh. never seen like those fish in a lot of, I mean, the, if you would catch a fish like that on the road river, yep. it would be, the, people <laughs> would be like, well, that's a stray from Canada or totally. something because it would be so out of place. Yeah. Right. So those are, I mean, and so that's where I like to like yep. to clarify, at least from my own perspective, that I because of because of my scientific background, I think of things in life histories with these fish, and an anadromous life history is different than, you know, a lake run. I forget what that technical term is. Mm-hmm. Um, a lake run life history, but they're both awesome. We have them. They come up out of the reservoirs that were created by the Willamette complex, and I won't tell you what time of year they move because it's a hush hush fishery, uh-huh. but there's damn nice fish yeah. and they're steelhead size. They're bigger than rogue river steelhead. Huh. So, you know, and, 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 and in the case of the great lakes, those are where they scamenia or are they, yep. I forget where their parentage was, but their parentage is West coast steelhead yep. too. And so That's they're right. going to have that more. I think there is a, you know, probably a few of those fish that become residents in yep. some of those rivers, but I just don't feel like those rivers, can support a lot of resident fish. And so that's why those fish moved out into the lake, exactly. right? Exactly. For them, you know, and so, yeah, yeah, I think they're awesome. And I'm really excited about like going out and fishing for them at some point. Like, that's cool. It's just a different way to do things. Skagit Master 4 is one of my favorites because it's Dave and Tom. Oh, yeah. 
you know, we, we boat swing. We boat swing for steelhead on the yep. on the uh, on the Willamette all the time. Yep. And on the McKenzie, it's one of the only ways I've seen people actually swing them. Huh. All of our McKenzie steelhead are usually bycatch. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You know, when we were nymphing for trout, we'd hook it. Or for some reason, the Mega Prince, when we'd be dragging that thing back up underneath a bobber they'd hit that on the i guess it's the hang down not the swing but oh, yeah. that's the only time like i don't yeah. actually go out i've only gone out on the mckenzie river once with the intention of swinging a steelhead and actually swung the steelhead yep oh, that's crazy yeah and that's so people have told me it's not a swingy river i don't know what that means yeah i don't know but yeah, yeah. well that was so. that was going to be one of uh one of the questions i was going to ask you i'm actually uh we're uh we're about out of time here so i think i was going to uh go into the lightning round but i think we're gonna have to save that for the uh the next uh the next episode if we can get you back on here and yeah anytime chat about chat about things uh because there's definitely a number of questions i, I do want to kind of uh get back to i guess a couple of quick ones here on um you know maybe you could just verify again um, or it sounds like so on the home river thing you really don't have a home river because you're kind of all well you know yeah you know i fish i fish the willamette a lot and then I fished the North Umpqua a lot. And okay. it's just yeah. because I, I know it, you know, I gotcha. went, you know, when, when, and this isn't a dig on anybody, I love Scott Howell to death. He's great. But if you're going to do, if you're going to do a, if you're going to do a, a like a, an appearance in a DVD video guides, don't yeah. sit in your rig when you do it, because that's where I learned a lot of spots is like, I oh, was yeah. like, that's, that's what he's driving. Okay. Uh-huh. And so I would look and see where Scott fished. You nice. know, he was up there. Or other guides too, not just Scott. Sure. Uh, every, you know, I learned, you know, I kind of learned that stuff. And then, you know, a couple years ago, I had fished it pretty hard for about a decade, I think, eight years, six years, six, six, seven years. When I moved to Eugene, like we would go down, you know, four or five times a winter and whatever. And I sure. caught like three fish, four fish. It wasn't, you know, in the in the winter time. You didn't really know it very well. And then um, I uh, I hired Scott. It was right after my dad had passed away, and um, you know, he was, I think, just basically because of what had happened, was being gracious enough to take me out because I know he's really busy and he doesn't usually have openings. Um, and I didn't really want to learn spots. Yeah. I wanted to learn how to fish, mm-hmm. you know, different water. And that's a really, really challenging place where you will walk up and you can, you, I mean, there's no secret. You know where the spots are because there's a pullout and a gigantic trail down to the bottom. Mm-hmm. But you might, <laughs> that's all you get. Yeah. And you got to learn, and it's very, very difficult. You got to make downstream mends or yep. weird stack yep. mends all through something or whatever. And right. so I just had him kind of show me how to fish different water. It was the only three fish day I had. Well, it wasn't a three fish day because I, I trout set on the first fish huh. and got yelled at for yep. trout setting on the first <laughs> fish. But then I went, you know, two for, for three with one of them being, you know, over 20. Wow. And so, you know, just learning how to fish it different, you know, learning how to, because, you know, people will sit there and you'll walk through a run and they cast and they mend. And they cast, they mend. It's the same mend every time. And yep. it's just not the way you should do things in my mind. you got to mm-hmm. change it up. So I really learned it. I really, hmm. and I don't say I know it well, but I learned kind of how to fish it a little bit better. And then, you know, met some other folks up there that, that were gracious enough to, you know, teach me a few things. Lee Spencer, I, I, I brought him some waders from the caddis fly and Eugene that he had repaired. Mm-hmm. And I got a chance sit down and talk with them and he gave my friend dan one of his uh loose hair muddlers that ended up in swing the fly magazine that photo mm-hmm. that he took of it was dan's you know from that oh, nice. and he also lee told us not not spots lee you know these guys don't tell you spots but they give you how to fish certain water tips uh-huh. and so now that i've learned that a little bit i really like going i mean i'll i'll if i have a choice because i live in eugene oregon but i also live in grantsville utah I split my time between the two places. Oh, wow. um, yeah. And so when I come back, I can really go wherever I want. Right. And so it's North Umpqua is kind of, gotcha. you know, in the last, last five years, pretty, pretty religiously going yeah. there. So I wouldn't consider it a home river because I'm not a local. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm not, yeah. I mean, I can grow up, you know, fishing it the way people like, you know, Mark Strangeland's son, uh, I believe his name is Karsten. You know, he's swung and skated steelhead up and he's like, you know, 13, 12 <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> or something, 10 or something. Yeah, a little guy. And, you know, it's because he is a local. He grew up on the river. Oh, yeah. Me, I just yeah. am an admirer of the river. If I ever have enough money, we'll buy, buy, a, we'll buy a, a place up there. But my yeah. where I learned the most about just steelheading in general was kind of the rogue and then um, 
the Willamette. Okay, Rogan Willamette. The, yeah, yeah. When I moved to Eugene, it was right outside my house. You know, that's awesome. And so that's awesome. Yeah, yeah I actually have. Uh, yeah, for the North Quiet, I interviewed Dean Finnerty in a few episodes yeah, a while back. Yeah, he 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 went a crazy interview. That was one of your best. When you talking, I yep. I knew yep. he was a police officer. I know that was the that was the extent of it, right? That, I didn't know he that, like dressed up like exactly a that was down meth guys. That, <laughs> and if you ever seen him in person, oh yeah, he is a giant of a man. You oh know? yeah, it's like you know. I could just. <laughs> that's sweet. That's sweet. Yeah, I'd like to see him dressed as the Buddhist. That would be. Yeah, and I don't know him. I'm only. No. Yeah, I don't. You know, but there's a run on the Willamette, and I'll name this one because you can only get into it from a boat. And yeah. It's new. It's been around maybe five years or something, four years, and they call it Finnerty's. Oh really? Yeah, and it's you know he guides on the Willamette. Oh okay. Um, if you sink your drift boat on the Willamette, there's That's a good right. chance that the guy. Dean Finnerty and, and Ty Holloway the, from uh, the Holloway brothers, yeah. Clay and Ty are amazing. So I was we were actually with Clay, um, oh from cool, Clay as uh, you know the, gotcha. the Holloway brothers fishing, and he parked my you know I had I was my my lady was out in Eugene with us and I was like hey Clay we're going out um you know and I hired him and I don't care what you do like you leave me alone all day but she's got to get a steelhead yeah and he's like cool. And it's, you know, that's a good guy. When you give him one job like that, it's yep. almost impossible. And he can, and he pulls it off. That's sweet. And he did. And so we, we parked up in Finnerty's and it's a weird run. It's, it's got the, it, you know, the thing about the Willamette is there's gravel bars that get, to, you know, moved around throughout the river uh-huh. and fish hold on the, you know, the slopes of them sometimes. And so that's kind of the thing is you, you park the jet boat and then you wade through a trough up onto a gravel bar and. It's a great run. Um, I've never been back in it because I haven't floated it since, but that's where my lady, she, her very first steal that ever was swung. Oh, sweet. And it was because, yeah, so it's because of, because of Clay Holloway and Finnerty's run. Gotcha. And oh. so that's now my favorite run on the river because that yep. was where she caught her first That's fish. perfect. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I was going to mention that uh, Frank Moore is the other North Umpqua guy that uh, I haven't oh. interviewed, but I've already talked to him and he's going to be on in hopefully a few, oh, a few episodes. So I'm excited to, in fact, I might yeah. even... Uh, make a trip down there, um, and, uh, meet up with them. So, um, yeah, no, this is, uh, yeah, yeah, totally. He's, he's obviously a a amazing guy, but uh, I remember seeing him cast when I was a kid. I didn't know who he was. Oh, no kidding. I made some comment about it up at, uh, he was fishing the camp water Uh and I was, I was a kid. I mean, I mean like seventh grade. Oh yeah. The seventh grade. And someone goes, oh, that was Frank down there. And I didn't know who Frank was. I would never been into the, I didn't really know. And so years later, when you know, I learned about Frank Moore. Um, I was like, "Oh my God, that's what they meant!" <laughs> it all made the connection that Frank. I met some pretty crazy people up there. Uh, the the guy that wrote um, the Secret Chronicles of the North Umpqua. Um, oh yeah. Um, uh, Pat McRae oh, okay. and his wife Becky. They're amazing, and uh-huh. he's you know he can't. He's blind now. Like, oh, wow. He can't see a thing. And she still leads him down to some of these runs. You know, you'll see him in no kidding. Upper Baker. You'll see him in both. Wow. You'll see him in some places. She still leads him into the runs. And Jeez. yeah, if that's not love, I don't know what is. Yeah. But yeah. Wow. That, uh, Dale that... Greenley. Dale Greenley watched Steelhead destroy one of my switch rods one day. <laughs> Dale Greenley was in uh, Shuey's Steelhead Flies book when he's talking about the skunk fly. Oh, Somehow yeah. Dale had to do with that. I don't know if it was his fly or he helped promote it. But huh. I, I, you know, I'd read his name and I'd heard about it. And, hooked the steelhead in this run which i won't name yeah and um the steelhead just destroyed this rod my it cut my face and scratched my oh, glasses like, huh. it blew up like it was sounded like a gunshot just pow wow and i almost landed the fish because i was pissed i was like oh it was a brand new rod oh and i just pulled the plastic off the handles like as i was walking you know yeah. getting set up on my tailgate um and huh. so that's what happened you know if there's, there, there's a flaw in the rod it's going to break the first time it bends yep you know, if your rod breaks three years in, that's your fault. Yeah, that's your fault. <laughs> not exactly. the rod. No, that's so you know, and you know, I come up and I'm bleeding, and he's like, Did "That fish break your rod?" I almost <laughs> got it. You know, I got I got the fish to my feet because I wanted the other half of my rod back, huh. and um, to send it in to yep. get a warranty. And then I won't say what company, but sure. they were awesome. They replaced it free. They didn't, you know, a whole new rod, whatever, well, maybe, just because it was maybe you should maybe you should uh, note the company since they. Yeah. <laughs> They replaced it. For yeah, no, it was a Beulah. It was a Beulah oh, yeah. rod. It had cool. nothing to do with the I fish a lot of Beulahs. Um, yeah. they, they're great rods, and yeah. James does a great job with them. And, That's cool. And, you know, it was just a uh, it's one of those things. The first time it bent, it yeah. exploded. And, so and there that's was something no- that happened. And they were great. They didn't even charge me. They didn't give me a piece. They gave me a whole new rod. Yeah. And then they didn't charge me anything. They were it, just, here you go. Totally. And that Sorry. was one of the questions we're not going to have time to get into, but I was going to. 
you know, talk to you guys, talk to you a little bit about, because I think every company that's been in business has, has had some issues with manufacturing. I mean, that's just part of the thing. And, and yeah, you, know, you know, you can have bad, a bad line or whatever, and just, sure. you have to deal with it. And the important thing is your customer service. I mean, that's the bottom line. You take care of your customer and you'll be okay. We try to. Yeah. yeah no, that's and awesome. I, you know, customer service can go both ways. You know I mean? A lot of times I don't want to just give you a free, you know, you, you, for me, you always kind of get one in my mind, like you get one mistake, but sure. if you step on your line seven times, I'm oh, not yeah. going to give you seven new no. running lines, but no. you know, yeah, but you know, it's, 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 so customer service sometimes is helping them make, you know, better decisions on the water. So they don't break their rod because 90% of broken rods that go to warranty departments are user error. Yep. You know, right. so anyway, I, I hear you. I hear you. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you get out of here. But uh, before I do, maybe you can uh, just uh, let us know where uh, people can find you if they, uh, you know, you or the company, if they want to have questions or get a hold of you. Yeah. So I do all the, there's two email addresses. They both come straight to me. But um, if you do info, I'll, I'll lower case, I'll lower case uh, info at opskagit.com. Mm-hmm. That goes, any questions that goes straight to our, you know, email inbox it all the you know what riot what line should i get for what rod uh-huh. question um uh-huh. and that you know if i'm not around i travel a lot for opst and I'll, I'll be um you know in alaska in a couple of weeks and stuff like that so they'll actually see those and they can address stuff too if i don't mm-hmm. get to it but if you want to email me directly um it's james.m at opskagit.com okay and um okay that was uh yeah. J- james.m yeah, M at opskagit.com. Uh, com. And I'll, opskagit.com, yeah. yeah I'll lowercase case again. And, yeah. Okay. I'll leave links to uh, all these uh, emails and Great. things like that in the show notes. Again, that was uh, this is going to be at uh, wetflyswing.com slash James. I'll have uh, all the, the links here. And, yeah, we've talked about some great stuff um, today. Cool. And I, yeah, I appreciate you coming on. I mean, I think um, you definitely uh, – told some some great stories and this episode is a little bit you know different than than some of the other ones and i think that's what's going to make it great and um, I, I really had a good time so i appreciate you coming on and sharing yeah. your knowledge and, and uh, having the conversation yeah no problem and if uh you guys have any other questions about some of the stuff i talked about or just in general you know info at op scan a great place to because you know all of us see that so Okay. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Infos. Yeah. The main one. All right. Great. Well, uh, yeah. I might have some questions for you down the line as well. So I'll check back. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. I will uh, yeah. talk to you soon and uh, have a good time out there. Yeah, for sure. Let me know when you want to test supplies. We get her done. All right. Sounds good. See ya. Have a great day. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 29. I wanted to read one review uh, from the show on iTunes here from Nyan Lama on iTunes. Nyan says, Entertaining resource. Dave's podcast is not only an opportunity to listen to a candid conversation with some of the great people associated with steelheading, there are precious nuggets of knowledge in each episode that will make you a better fly fisher. Subscribe and enjoy today. Man, thanks, Nyan uh, Lama, for taking the time to leave a review. That was completely amazing. I appreciate it. Uh, you can go to wetflyswing.com slash review to find directions on how to leave an honest rating and review. Uh, the rev- uh, reviews help us get the show out to more fly fishers, and hopefully we'll help them get into some more fish. So uh, thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and maybe even seeing you online or on the river. Later. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.